All right, happy Memorial Day, everybody. We're going to go over some of this pretty quick. Um, as the army in Europe breaks out of the hedgerows and begins their run across France, the Marines in the Pacific were experiencing something completely different on the islands of like Saipan, Guam, and Tinian, where the Japanese will quit with their all-out suicide bonsai charges and they will begin to prepare fixed defenses and as we go through these four islands in 1944 the Japanese soldiers and civilians rather than be captured some of them would even leap to their own deaths at a place called Marpy Point and we pretty much have to kill every single one of them so the death tolls are going to dramatically rise and for the first time as you can see here the soldiers are going to have to experience Japanese fixed defenses built into into the terrain and the geography of these Pacific Islands making them very difficult to spot so this is you know a shot in the 1940s and a lot of these installations are still there to this very day so after attacking in like Saipan and Guam, what was supposed to be uh, I, an exercise that would take a couple of weeks takes months. And as you can see, of the 32,000 Japanese soldiers on the island, only 2,000 of them will be taken prisoner. Marines were literally rolling grenades down the cliffs into little holes like caves they dug in to blow them out because they would not surrender. And here's some of the pictures. You can see the two Marines sitting right here watching people jump off the cliffs rather than be captured. So it's shortly after Saipan Falls that we go into Guam. And here the opponent is going to be a guy named Takishi Takashama. And once again, while the beach landings were easier, um, the Marines have got to find their fight their way through these carefully constructed beach obstacles and the Japanese dug into the mountains here on the island of Guam. Um, when it was all said and done, another 1,800 Americans are killed while only 20 Japanese soldiers will remain alive to be captured and most of them were wounded. To the fanaticism of this, the last Japanese soldier near Guam will surrender to a group of marine biologists, the Department of the Navy, in 1974. They had to get his old drill instructor and his sister to come and tell him that the empire had fallen. That is the tenacity and the fanaticism of what this, um, our marines are facing in the um, Pacific. So, shortly... Um, after that, the island of Tinian is going to be assaulted. It is from this island where the Enola Gay will um, take over um, to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. This is the first time the brand spanking new B-29 will be used. So now we are within range. You can see Saipan and Tinian there. We are within range of bombing mainland Japan. So we turn the island into a giant air base and our B-29 super fortresses begin to bombard the home islands of Japan. So I know we're going through this quick here, but the battles for these three islands had been extremely costly. Japanese defense is getting more and more and more intense as we're, island hopping is getting ever so closer to the home islands. Um, this is going to cause in Japan um, for the one of the evil little guys, the guy who instigated all of this, Hideki Tojo, will be forced to resign. And it is during this that there will be a battle and the recapture of the Philippines and a place called the uh, Mar Marianas um, Turkey Shoot um, that while um, Japan is going to lose, there's no doubt about that, but it is going to cost a heavy toll. Hundreds of young men and marines are going to be killed or, or wounded. So, um, there is Hideki Tojo. He is now gone. So there will be a battle in the Philippine Sea, which we are unfortunately going to skip to um, uh, 
due to lack of time, but it is a great fantastic battle where American air power will destroy planes, aircraft, submarines, naval craft. Um, you can see the ratio. 243 of the 373 Japanese planes that were sent in the airborne were destroyed while we only lost 30 different planes. And the new submarine, the Albacore, which is still a museum up in um, uh, New Hampshire, will begin to sink the Navy's flagships. We just, it's, and the pilots up there called this the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot as they just literally obliterated everything that the Japanese put up into the air and on the sea. And so, the battle for the Philippine Sea is over with an American victory, and the Japanese will lose 200 aircraft. And all of the sudden, the newer, bigger, faster American planes, who had kept getting better throughout the war, are now more than a match for um, Japan. Japan can no longer go out and actively engage enemy planes and ships of war. So this is when they begin to turn to kamikaze pilots. It is something that is a last um, resort. And this brings us to the main story of the day here, the island of Peleliu. It will be fought, think of the same time, as Operation Market Garden. While the 82nd and 101st is jumping in to the Netherlands, the Marines are going to assault the island of Peleliu. Once again, it's only supposed to take three or four days, just like Tinian. Instead, it takes months. Um, it is one of the most brutal and costliest battles in the Pacific, a brutal war of attrition. And it was part of the um, Caroline Islands, the far western part of the Caroline Islands, that had a large Japanese airfield that had to be eliminated, and what we thought housed about 30,000 Japanese soldiers. The island was said to be necessary by Douglas MacArthur, um, as it lay on the flank of our assault to recapture the Philippine Islands. So, in Douglas MacArthur's mind, it had to be taken. A lot of experts disagree, but we are never going to know. So there is the island of Peleliu, a very thin, long neck, and then a big, think of like a turkey leg or like a um, um, drumstick, is what it looks like. And the 1st Marine Division are going to be sent in, uh, 17,500 guys, led by Major General w William Rupertus. And because the Japanese naval power had been weakening, we had every indication that this thing is going to be taken very, very, very quickly. However, Japanese commander Nakagawa decided what we're going to do is we are going to let the Americans come ashore. We're going to suck them in, kind of like von Rundstadt's idea on um, defending the D-Day beaches. And then we're going to fall back to the middle of the island, the Umbregal Mountains, that are made of coral. And we're going to dig in there, and we're going to tunnel in through and around and control the interior of the island. So we could pop out in front, behind, off to the side, and the Americans are going to have a difficult time finding us. There is Rupertus and Nakagawa getting ready to engage in one of the nastiest fights in all of World War II. Um, each cave is going to have a steel submarine door with three entrances. So if American soldiers came, you ducked behind your steel door and you locked it and you waited it out. Machine guns, artillery, pre-sighted and crisscrossed the um, island. And from his command post in the Umbrugal Mountains, Nakagawa could see and command the entire battle from his hilltop fortress. And the coral will form a giant funnel to which the American soldiers later figured out and discovered 500 Ks. They had food, they had ammunition, they had medical supplies. They were built to stay there. They knew they weren't getting help. They were going to win or they were all going to die. Well, after a three-day aerial and naval bombardment, the first Marines land. And the Japanese, down in their caves, suffered very little from this bombardment. And as soon as the Marines started hitting the shore 
out popped the machine guns, the Naboo machine gun, and the Marines were just cut down as they were getting out of their landing craft. It was a shocking experience for some of the new Marines. By the end of the first day, barely off the beach, the Marines had suffered 1,100 casualties. And part of the problem on Peleliu is it was so hot, just a coral, rocky face. If you've been to the American Southwest, the temperature was, you know, while it's freezing for the Army and Market Garden, out in Peleliu it was 113 to 115 degrees every day. Making this worse, all the freshwater wells were poisoned by the Japanese, so our Marines had no fresh water for a large part of this battle. Um, the water they did get, the Navy filled all old kerosene and gas and oil drums and shipped them ashore, but oftentimes they didn't wash them out. So the water that our Marines drank was laced with either gasoline, kerosene, and sometimes like a motor oil. So by the end of the first week, by September 19th, the Marines were depending upon Navy bombers to blast the Japanese out of these dugout huts while they advanced forward. On September 18th, they have to do something that is going to be part of your exam where they are going to have to cross a Japanese airfield. From beginning to end, it was about 800 yards, almost the exact same distance the soldiers had to experience as they got out of the landing craft on D-Day. And here as the Marines run across this wide open airfield, they taste the intricate fury that Nakagawa and his men laid out for um, defense. And you can see, um, you know, going into the mountains here is a machine gun nest. There's another one back in here. You can see all the bombardment done by the aerial aircraft. Well, it didn't really do anything. And you got, you know, you're fighting across a wide open airfield with no trees, finding guys hidden up in this mountain. It was virtually impossible. Well, the Marines are going to capture the airfield, and they began to celebrate. Only then did they find out they had to go into the Death Star, they had to go into the mountain fortress of the Umbergall Mountains and root out the Japanese buried in there. Um, the quick story, I'll tell you more about it in class, Captain George Hunt goes up to the top. There was a little plateau above the airfield where they were afraid artillery would um, be able to blast you know, holes in the runway or planes. George Hunt goes up with 170 men. He and his men will get trapped up there for the next three weeks. By the time he is done, the Japanese coming from under the ground, from out of the mountains, he will be down to 18 men when he is finally rescued after the battle. Great story, I'll tell you about it in class. And as they punch forward, the Marines are going to land at a place called Bloody Nose Ridge, where they are going to fight the final approach to get into the mountains. Japanese snipers came out of everywhere and English speaking Japanese soldiers would infiltrate at night kill the attackers with knives and swords and Nakagawa told his men to remain hidden you fire only when you can inflict maximum damage do not expose yourself needlessly only when you can kill 10 15 or 20 marines should you reveal your position and it was just a meat grinder with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, slogging it out, going up this um, mountain chain. So um, you're going to ask me if you watch this to tell you the stories of Captain Everett Pope and Private Tommy Adkins, a hero of, of Peleliu. Well, those two were winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. Sledge and Lecky are going to be fighting up the mountain chain. And Sledge will hear Japanese down in a bunker that was marked cleared and he said no there are Japanese down in there well nobody believed him until he jumps down in there and they're screaming and yelling and crashing and banging and when Sledge comes out he has killed eight other Japanese soldiers finding their little you know spider holes and hidden trap door so he earns the nickname Sledgehammer at that point as they just keep going forward. Um, 
The Marines were not only fighting the psychological warfare of not being able to see their enemy, but the heat and the dehydration was taking its toll. There was no relief. They began to get what is called the thousand yard stare, where you're looking straight ahead and your body is moving almost um, robotically. Some of the mind went into like a mild form of shock just to suppress the horrors they were going through. And at night, getting ready to make a final assault, the Marines had to dig in um, foxholes to defend against Japanese artillery. And they were in this valley, and all of a sudden, the hard, rocky ground, they said, gave way to something that was really soft and, and, and mushy. And as they started digging and they jumped down into their foxholes, literally millions of maggots broke through the surface of the ground. The Marines had found a Japanese burial pit where they had you know, buried their own soldiers and civilians and threw a layer of dirt on them in this valley. And those are the foxholes the guys had to stay in with maggots crawling all over them as the Japanese began a counterattack. So the first Marines will lose 60%. The 5th and 7th Marines who were brought in to help out will lose 50%, causing the General, Roy Geiger, to do something no Marine ever wants to do, and that's call the United States Army for support. That's just how bad um, it was. Um, you can see this Jeep being converted, a guy holding you know, um, a plasma with two tubes trying to keep multiple men alive, another medevac Jeep. Um, right behind him. This was Peleliu. You can see the Marines here. They kind of look like rocks. The, you know, the forest is blown apart. There's smoke everywhere. They're sitting here like they're in like a desert. You can look at this guy's face. The guy's smoking the cigarette. He's just staring off. It's miserable. There's no nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. The terrain can't help you. And this is a schematic of just one mountain, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 rooms in all of these tunnels that had food and medicine and ammunition and trap doors. This is just in one section, one level of the northern ridge of the Umbergol Mountains. And the whole island was laced with like a little ant colony um, underneath. So it's into things like this, as you see this American Marine that has to go in. We gotta find the American or the, the Japanese soldiers and blow them out of there. We could not advance until we were sure there was absolutely nobody um, behind us. Um, here you have this nice artillery piece and a machine gun camouflaged beautifully. And this is where Sledge will earn his nickname Sledgehammer, is when there was a difficult nest. They would send, send us the hammer and Sledge would go in, a couple hours later come back out all dirty and bloody and nasty and he had rooted the um, Japanese out of there. By the end of October, the Marines were so badly shot up, the Army has to replace them. And the Army will experience the same battleground for another month to just a little bit after Thanksgiving. Each cave, they had to throw in grenades rockets, machine guns, and then flamethrowers as the Japanese would not surrender. 98% of the Japanese soldiers on Peleliu died. 200 of them will survive, and that's only because most of them were wounded. The last Japanese soldier in Peleliu did surrender in 1947 after the war was over. He had lived in the Coral Mountains for two years after the war on the supplies that they had there. And this dictates the fanaticism as next we've got to go to Iwo Jima and then Okinawa. So it is going to cause a strategic shift in the military command of how we are going to end this war. And you can see the villagers on the island um, were terrified until the medics showed up and they began helping out and giving medical aid like to this little baby um, right here. The battle would cost the United States 10,000 casualties and while we do get to use the um, airfield it was later found out 
that um, for MacArthur's attack in the Philippines, Peleliu would not have influenced that outcome one way or the other. But we're going to learn the Japanese have a new strategy, digging in having layers upon layers of defenses. And as the closer we got to the mainland, the more fanatical the resistance was going to be, which will in turn lead to the bombing of Japan. Here on the left is the real Robert Lecky, and on the right is um, the real Eugene Sledge, and we'll tell you some of their stories, and I see you guys in class tomorrow. Over and out.